设计师眼中的人类生活与机器人技术。大家听一听“萝卜太辣”这个词啊，太有吸引力了啊！那么下面我们就听一听克尔先生是怎么介绍“萝卜太辣”的。有请克尔先生，鼓励一下。好，谢谢。Okay, so I'm going to talk about the、uh, basically a little bit about the past of robotics, the present, and the future where it's going.、Um, I'm John Sokol. I've、uh, been a pioneer in doing、uh, digital audio,、uh, digital video. I、uh, also worked on the first open source operating system that got published to the internet, 3D6BSD.、Uh, I did some of the first streaming video on the internet in 1990.、Uh, I also did a content distribution network for the internet in 1994. I've worked for companies like Stanford University, NASA, Wells Fargo, Fujitsu. Uh, TiVo and many others.、Uh, most recently, I was the chief technical officer for a company called Anibots that does telepresence robotics. Also developed a small robot on Kickstarter called the Little Bot, and now I'm working with Roboterra to help uh, with uh, teaching children robotics and education, which I see is、uh, vital for the、uh, future of our children because basically, you know, companies like Foxconn said they're replacing a million employees with robots. Uh, but they're going to need people to maintain the robots and to program the robots and develop the robots.、Um, so, you know, the skills are all going to be much higher level skills. Okay, so、um, this was actually a 45 minute talk. I'm going to kind of try and blow through it as quick as I can. <laughs>、uh, so, one of the issues is what is a robot?、Um, you know, originally it was a, basically a, a, an electronic slave or forced labor.、Uh, Czechoslovakian word.、Um, there have been things、uh, in history, like the Golem, where this was an、um, animated creature made of clay or mud that was used to do your bidding、uh, in legend.、Um, and、uh, robots have started showing up in things like plays in 1920.、Uh, 1927 is really the, the, the most classic Metropolis robot. Uh, today, we've got things like、uh, friendly Star Wars robots and, and Terminator robots that are, are destroying humanity.、Um, in reality, we've got golems today.、Uh, today, we've got things like the 3D printed robots、uh, that you see here on the、uh, left, as well as the Antibots robot on the right,、uh, which is my company.、Uh, and then you've got robots that have nothing to do with human forms at all, like the Roomba and robotic arms that everyone. Agrees are robots, but have nothing to do with human forms and anthropomorphic、uh, nature.、Um, so, a lot of robots people are pushing for human-like. The problem with this is, as you get more and more human-like, it gets creepy.、Uh, it's actually kind of un, just just uncomfortable to be around.、Uh, so, let me talk a little bit about the past of robots.、Uh, so, in the Qing Dynasty, about two thousand two hundred years ago. Uh, they were doing、uh, mechanical fish, dragons,、uh, entire orchestras、uh, that were powered by water wheels that were entirely mechanical、uh, but programmed.、Um, this was actually quite common as well across Europe in temples and things like this. So, so this robotic technology goes back quite a long ways.、Um, everyone seems to think it's a very recent invention. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci made some incredible robots, both anthropomorphic and something、uh, very similar to turtle bots that that the children are playing with today in the maker community,、uh, with his programmable cart, which used a series of cams and and would actually do various patterns of driving around、uh, dead reckoning. Now, what I consider to really be the first sort of modern robot is the Jacquard loom. Uh, which was really the foundation of the Luddite movement, which actually displaced an enormous number of employees and caused a lot of chaos across Europe uh, politically, um, because all the loom workers suddenly became unemployed as、uh, digitally programmed paper punch card machines、uh, replaced their jobs. Now, in the course of researching this, I came across something truly amazing、uh, that, to me, completely changes the history of computing in my mind.、Uh, Jacquard had a method for actually digitizing photos and printing them in silk in 1830, and here's a self-portrait in silk、um, that's in the museum right now, and it's just like wow.、Um, so I also show here this is really the first official turtle bot in 1948, just after World War II.、Uh, 
really the first robotic arm used for manufacturing in 1960. Um, now telepresence, this is really something near and dear to my heart, uh, was uh, the first real telepresence robot was the, uh, I, I'm going to try and pronounce it, Lunikod, uh, by the Russians where it was really a video operated telepresence robot on the surface of the moon and it was really an impressive accomplishment. Uh, very few people in America have any awareness of this at all. Um, but a lot of people don't realize that the rockets that took these craft to the moon were actually teleoperated robots, uh, and they had control servo mechanisms uh, that allowed them to do an inverted pendulum balancing, very similar to the Antibots QB and the little bot that I most recently worked on. Very similar control algorithms in these. Um, that same control algorithm now can extend it to things like the, the Terminator-like Petman, which is truly uh, a terrifying machine if you've actually seen one in action. Uh, also the very cute Honda Asthma and the Antibots Dexter, which is, as far as I know, one of the first successful working, walking robots. Um, and, you know, but today what we have for, ro for robots is things like the Roomba and the Google self-driving car, which is seen every day in Silicon Valley. Uh, these cars are everywhere. Uh, they were driving them for almost three years on the road without telling anybody. And then suddenly, like, a human was driving one, it got into an accident, and it, like, it just blew out in the news. It was like, oh my God, we've been driving these things without humans holding the steering wheel, just sitting there, you know, with their foot near the brake if something happened. Um, so now we've got a new revolution of drones. Uh, and these things, you know, kind of have a bad reputation from warfare. But uh, Amazon's trying to do delivery services. The American government is doing their best to, to foil and terrify people developing these drones from actually building them. Um, you know, we accidentally flew one over the NASA Air Base uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it was like, uh, guys, uh, we shouldn't do that. Um, <laughs> um, so the basis for a lot of modern robotics now is uh, 3D printing technology. Um, this changes everything because suddenly, instead of having to uh, use a milling machine and a lathe and band saws and dangerous tools, I can go to a nice clean CAD system, design something, I can uh, print it, I can share it with my friends, they can edit it, modify it, make improvements, and suddenly hardware becomes software. Uh, there's a software package called SCAD that allows me to write code that turns into 3D objects. Uh, it's incredible technology. Um, that suddenly makes making mechanical things like robots as simple as generating phone apps. Um, telepresence. Um, I don't know if the video clip will work here. Let's see. No, maybe not. Okay. Um, so I've been working on telepresence robots most recently, which are basically video conferencing on wheels. And it's, it's funny the amount of pushback I'm getting from investors like, oh, we don't believe there's a market here. Uh, and then I look back at, at uh, 1938 where, where the New York Times says there's no market for televisions because people won't have time to sit in front of them and watch them. Uh, or Alexander Graham Bell actually being scolded by his investors because they wanted a multiplexed telegraph uh, and no one had an interest in communicating by voice over wire. Um, and so uh, Recently, now with the Antibots QB, we had five of these things operating in Israel in a water park for, for three weeks with hundreds of kids, thousands uh, all over them, uh, and people all over the world were able to attend uh, this concert in Israel uh, via the telepresence robots, uh, which changes the game. I see a lot of people here from science museums. Imagine if children don't even need to leave their house, uh, sick kids in school, uh, or even just entire classrooms can attend the museum, see the exhibits, and hear lectures without ever once having to actually physically go anywhere, but just sitting in front of a computer or a phone. Um, so then we take this to the next level, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, which I see is very tightly coupled with robotics, much more than people suspect. Uh, things like the IMU, MEMS, gyros, uh, accelerometers, and gyros, uh, play very tightly into virtual reality uh, and are also very uh, tightly coupled with drones and balancing robots. Um, so in this, uh, again, I don't have the video working here right now, but uh, in this demo here, uh, she moves her hand, the robot moves its hand, 
Uh, she turns her head, the robot turns its head, and she is literally the robot. That robot is her in the other world. Uh, if, if we can get this in the Fukushima, we could actually repair it, but I don't know what they're thinking. Anyway, um, so the future, you know, we're migrating towards this path and there's a whole movement, uh, especially around Silicon Valley called the singularity, uh, where man and machine are merging, that, that people's lifespans might reach infinity, basically, where we never die anymore. Um, we start replacing parts of us with, with uh, mechanical machines and extending our capabilities. Um, so right now there's things on the horizon like brain interfaces. Uh, I've had the Antibots QB operated by somebody with locked-in syndrome and, and for the first time in his life he was suddenly zipping back and forth across our factory uh, free from his bed and, and, and able to experience the world and drive up and communicate with people uh, in a way that he had never been able to do before. Um, very simple technology uh, to do this, actually. Um, but uh, these things are getting very advanced very quickly. Um, and, and it may be possible to have full uh, immersive experiences through nothing but brain interfaces shortly. Um, so where are we going with, the, with this? Uh, right now, people keep thinking of robots as the machine, a little box that does something, and it's got all the intelligence in it. There was a Hosma Asma where they like, oh, and here's a little spot where we're going to put the intelligence. And I looked at this, and I'm like, that's insane. Um, we've got Amazon Web Services, you know, millions of machines, almost infinite, unlimited compute power out in the cloud. Um, the real key is to making robots as part of the IT infrastructure where that artificial intelligence as well as distributed human intelligence and call centers can operate these robots so that we can have salespeople uh, can bring in a remote expert to advise you on plumbing in the hardware store or you know what type of clothing or anything in kind of store uh, stores, you know, uh, suddenly all the salespeople are busy. We can bring in a new salesperson from a store who's sitting around idle to help service additional customers. Um, so cloud-based robotics really is the future of, of where robotics is going. And uh, Antibots, we actually have this done. We're developing APIs so that uh, kids can use robots a lot like the way they would use a shared printer right now. So they, they can write their software. They, they call a robot. They can do something. When they're done, we can put them on different size robots or, or bigger things. And then there's general artificial intelligence. Uh, we've got the uh, Watson and the legendary HAL 9000 that uh, Arthur C. Clarke had written about. <coughs> um, and these are really going to be, I think, the, the place where, where um, telepresence robots are going to be quite interesting because these are going to be the, the foundational interface for these kind of new artificial intelligences uh, that are emerging. Um, and, you know, here's the movie iRobots where they showed a prime example of the robots with some level of autonomy, but then there was this giant super brain that was able to take them over and control them in, in the case of the movie. It was done for evil purposes. Um, and here we've got something called the uh, Allobot, A-L-Y-O, a uh, friend of mine at the Hacker Dojo where I, I spend my time doing some work, uh, is developing this. It's got a 30-second latency but uh, she's got a thousand children driving and operating this very, very simple robot made out of erector set parts. Um, and uh, they're able to do some amazing things, uh, you know, drive around, uh, grab things. We had one on a pool table where I was operating my robot and they actually drove up on my laptop and were attempting to control the larger robot by driving on the keys with the smaller one. It grabbed my mouse and I was like, give me that back, you know. <laughs> um, and so where is this going? Um, if you can operate a telepresence robot with 30 seconds latency and the children were very much interested in controlling this and, and affecting their environment remotely, um, there's no reason why they couldn't be driving robots on the moon right now. And we can literally crowdsource the exploration of the surface of the moon and let thousands of school children doing this. So I'd like to put out a challenge for both the American and Chinese governments uh, to actually put telepresence robots that school children can drive. Um, and this actually can be a reality. I mean, uh, people like Elon Musk are talking about $1,000 a pound to get into space. Uh, right now, I'm hearing numbers like 15,000. Space Adventures was talking about $100,000 for people to take space tourism to the moon. 
there's no reason why we couldn't have thousands of small robots on the surface of moon as well as in classrooms and other environments like the Arctic. Um, and uh, so I really see telepresence as the killer app for, for children. Um, basically being able to explore the ship in uh, Argentina or, or Antarctica or go places where, where you really wouldn't want to expose small children because of the journey and environmental hazards, but they could actually take field trips anywhere in the world in an afternoon. Uh, they could be interacting with children all over the world, uh, you know, American children, Chinese children, Indian children, playing together, you know, in each other's homes using telepresence robots. And that is the conclusion of my talk. Um, and, uh, you know, part of this is I'm doing this through Roboterra. Uh, we have a booth here, and uh, I encourage you to come by and, and see the robots that we have. Thank you. Thank you very much. 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 Thank you 下一个会客厅，也就本单元的另一个会客厅，来探讨一下科普信息化与科普产业发展的相关问题。我们要请的几位嘉宾是丹麦科学工厂负责人 b a u 先生，德国科学日主席 l e 先生，南非科技。